Thanks, Mark. Um, thank you. Um, thanks so much for having me, and thanks so much for being here. It's great to see so many people here. Um, so, um, I'll go to my first slide. Um, I'm here to talk about the power of the mind over the body and what science can tell us about that. So, we're here at Action for Happiness. We often think of happiness as being to do with psychological well-being, but does that feed through into our physical bodies? Can our minds, our thoughts, emotions and beliefs ever heal us? Um, and that is a, a pretty controversial question um, with very strongly held opinions on both sides. Um, on the one side, there's a whole industry of mind-body therapies out there making some very strong claims about the power of the mind. Um, sometimes it's, it's even as if you could just cure basically anything by just thinking positively enough. Um, there's just some books here that you can buy. Um, on the subject, we've got um, Anything Can Be Healed, um, Change Your Mind, Heal Your Body. Um, one of them, Mind Over Medicine, um, claims to be based on cold hard science. Um, th that, the author of that book, she says, um, we hold within us self-healing superpowers that are stronger than any chemotherapy and more effective than any surgery. So these are really strong claims being made on one side of the debate. Um, on the other side, we have the skeptics. Um, they are often um, people from conventional science and medicine. Um, and for these skeptics, any idea of healing thoughts is deluded, dangerous quackery. Um, these are some quotes from interviews that I've done with different academics and also some comment pieces that they've written. And so for these skeptics, the idea that the mind could heal us is rubbish, tooth fairy science, oppressive and morally offensive. Why would actively doing nothing have any active physiologic effect? It doesn't and it shouldn't. So that's just to give you an idea before we start about the, the strength of feeling that this topic can, uh, can trigger in people. Um, for me, I'm a, a science journalist. I've got a PhD in genetics. I've spent most of my career covering the latest advances in science. And when I came to this topic to write um, this book, Neither of those extremes made sense to me. We all know that the mind, our minds can affect our bodies. If you just think about stepping out into the road, if you're almost hit by a car, you feel your heart racing, adrenaline being released into the bloodstream. So we know that happens. But on the other hand, I don't think that necessarily makes the mind a miracle cure. I think we need to investigate what it can do, what it can't do, how it works in a, in a scientific, evidence-based way. So when I was writing Cure, I wanted to know, what does the research really tell us? Um, it's such a big topic, but um, for today, I, I've, I've chosen three ways in which our minds can affect our bodies that I want to tell you about. Um, and we'll look at sort of how and why they work and at some of the approaches that scientists are studying. Um, so the first one, believe, this is to do with how our emotions and beliefs can influence the symptoms that we experience, things like pain, nausea, and fatigue. And learn, this isn't intellectual learning, like memorizing times tables, that's to do with more physical learning, how our brains and bodies work together to learn to associate uh, different environments and situations with particular physical responses, and we'll look at how we can use that to our advantage. And then reframe, is looking at the importance of our outlook, how we see the world, and how changing our outlook can also shift our physical health. So to start off with, I'm going to tell you a story about the power of belief. Um, this is Bonnie Anderson. Um, she lives in Minnesota with her partner Don, and a few years ago she slipped over on wet kitchen tiles and fractured her spine. And she was left in a lot of pain after that. She told me that she couldn't stand up to do the dishes, she couldn't play the golf that she loves to play, um, she was having trouble sleeping at night. And so she took part in a trial of a promising new surgical procedure called vertebroplasty. And this is where surgeons inject medical-grade cement into the broken bone to strengthen it. And it was having really promising results. Patients were saying that their pain was gone within a few hours. Within a few days, they were back to all their normal activities of daily life. And this was true for Bonnie as well. It was wonderful, she told me. I was able to go back to my golfing and everything that I wanted to do. What she didn't know at the time, though, was that the surgery she received was fake the surgeon acted out the entire procedure and she never received that injection of cement. Um, and she wasn't the only one. 
There were 131 patients in that trial. Um, and overall, their pain and disability scores almost halved after the procedure, but there was no difference between the group who got the real surgery and the group who got the fake surgery. So in these patients with fractured spines, the surgery worked, but their belief in the surgery was just as effective as the surgery itself. Now, this is an example of a well-known phenomenon, I'm sure you've heard of it, called the placebo effect, where if we receive medical treatment, often we feel better, even if it turns out that that treatment was fake. Um, and this is a well-known uh, phenomenon. It's seen across lots of different medical conditions, lots of different kinds of treatments, from pills to surgery. It's the reason that we test all new drugs against placebos. Um, but this placebo effect itself is often seen as little more than an illusion or a statistical quirk. The argument goes that if you feel better after receiving fake medicine, then presumably you would have just felt better anyway. A lot of people do better with time. Or maybe you just think you feel better, uh, but nothing has really changed. And those two are valid explanations. But there is actually a lot of research now um, showing that something else really interesting is going on. Um, neuroscientists like this guy, Fabrizio Benedetti, is one of the world's top placebo researchers, are now able to look inside people's brains at what's happening when they take placebos. And they are finding that fake treatments can trigger measurable biological changes that are very similar to the changes that are caused by drugs. Um, for example, if you take a fake painkiller, that triggers the release of endorphins. These are natural pain-relieving chemicals that bind to the same receptors in the brain as painkillers like morphine. So if you take a fake painkiller, a placebo painkiller, and your pain reduces, you haven't imagined that change. Your pain has actually gone down through exactly the same biological mechanism as if you had taken morphine. Um, and... Um, Neuroscientists like Benedetti are showing that we get these biological placebo effects not just when we take um, placebos, but when we take real medicines as well. So if you take a real painkiller, between a third and two-thirds of the pain relief that you feel isn't down to the, biolog the direct biological action of that drug. It's down to your belief in that drug, to the placebo effect. Painkillers are much less effective if we don't know that we've taken them. Um, there are also different mechanisms of placebo effects, so the release of endorphins is one. Um, in Parkinson's disease, for example, where placebo effects are quite strong, um, neuroscientists have seen a flood of dopamine in the patient's brains, um, just as when they take their real drug, sometimes as large as when they take their real drug. Um, and a third example is has changed. A third example is altitude sickness. So uh, Benedetti is studying this at this lab that he's built, three and a half thousand meters above sea level in the Alps. Um, I was able to visit him there. Um, this is the, the view out of the window, so you can see how high up and, and remote it is. You have to take three different cable cars to get there from the nearest ski resort. Um, and this is one of his volunteers, David. Um, so David has uh, come up to altitude just that morning from Turin, which is at sea level, and he's working out on the stepper, um, and breathing supplementary oxygen, um, or he thinks he is. Actually, that canister is empty. He is breathing fake or placebo oxygen. Um, Benedetti is comparing um, groups of volunteers who get this placebo oxygen with volunteers who don't. And he's shown that the ones who get the placebo perform better at altitude, and they have fewer symptoms of altitude sickness. And again, there's a biological mechanism behind this. Their bodies produce lower levels of prostaglandins, which are chemicals um, produced when we're in low oxygen conditions, and which are responsible for many of the symptoms of altitude sickness. So... In all of these examples, pain, Parkinson's disease, altitude sickness, um, people's beliefs are actually triggering very similar biological changes to the changes that are caused by drugs. Um, one reason that placebo effects haven't been taken that seriously until recently is because they're very variable, very slippery, hard to study. The, the proportion of people who respond to placebos varies from zero to 100%, depending on the circumstances. Um, different placebos can have positive, neutral, or even negative effects, depending on what we're told about them. And, and this doesn't really seem to make any sense because you know, there's nothing in a placebo, so how could different placebos be different? How could nothing be different to nothing. Um, but that's really looking at placebos backwards, because 
There is nothing in a placebo. It's inert. It can't do anything. What's triggering the placebo effect is your psychological response to that placebo, what receiving that treatment means to you. And that can differ between people and in different situations. And Psychologists have been studying what is it about the psychological response that triggers these biological changes. And one of the, the main things is expectation. So how do you expect your condition to change or improve as a result of taking that treatment? And that in turn depends on a lot of other things, things like what you've been told about treatment, your experiences if you've taken that treatment before, whether you're an optimistic person in general, whether you slept well the night before. Um, in general, though, um, anything that gives the impression of a potent, effective treatment is going to trigger a larger placebo effect. So in general, surgery works better than injections, which work better than pills. Um, in trials, um, two placebo pills trigger a larger effect than one pill. Um, larger pills work better than smaller pills. Um, brand name pills do work better than generics because of the impression that they create with you. Um, there are also um, cultural differences, though. Um, so generally in trials, um, red or pink pills are particularly good at triggering placebo responses for pain, whereas blue pills are better at treating anxiety or problems with sleep, except among Italian men. I don't know if anyone can guess why. Um, the researchers think it's because blue is the colour of the um, Italian national football team. So for them, blue is not a calming colour, it's actually an exciting colour. So that's just to emphasise this point that it's really nothing to do with the pill. It's, it's all about the individual and, and the meaning that that placebo has for you. Um, if you're anything like me, at this point, you're probably going to be thinking, why? Uh, why would thinking that a particular physical change is going to happen in the body actually make that change happen? Uh, and to answer that, it's useful to think about why we experience symptoms in the first place. Um, things like pain, nausea, fatigue, they're not there just to make us miserable. Um, they have evolved as warning signs. Um, they're there to warn us that we're in danger um, and to persuade us to take action to remove ourselves from that danger. And the brain is constantly calculating what is the appropriate level of any particular symptom um, that it's appropriate for us to be experiencing at that time, depending on how severe it assesses a particular threat to be. Um, and the physical state of our body, damage from things like infection and injury, is obviously really important in that calculation. But it's not the whole story. Your, your psychological um, assessment, conscious or unconscious, of a threat is important too. So if you're feeling um, afraid, stressed, uh, alone, particularly worried about a certain um, condition or symptom, that is going to trigger biological uh, changes in the brain that amplify that symptom, that push that warning signal up. On the other hand, if you're feeling safe, cared for, um, you've received what you believe to be effective medical treatment, you think you're going to be feeling better very soon, that's a signal to the brain that the crisis is over. It can trigger biological changes that push the symptom down. So placebo research has really taken us into a much broader point about the importance of our mental state for how we feel. Um, whether you're feeling safe or, or threatened, whether you think things are going to get better or worse, whether you're feeling stressed or cared for, all of these things can trigger biological changes that influence the symptoms that we experience. So how can we use that? Um, one thing to remember is that you are actually using these placebo effects every time you take a treatment. So when you take a real treatment, you're getting the biological effect of that treatment, but you're also, in addition, getting any placebo effect. But there are a lot of conditions where actually drugs don't work that well, um, and there are significant downsides to taking drugs, things like side effects and addiction. So I'm thinking about conditions like chronic pain, mild to moderate depression, irritable bowel syndrome. And, and for these kinds of um, conditions, um, researchers are thinking about, well, how can we use placebo effects without using the drugs? Um, one option that's getting scientists quite excited is honest placebos. You can buy placebos online if you want to. So um, where's my pointer? These are some that I bought online. They're in my uh, kitchen cupboard at home. Um, 
The dogma about placebos has always been that they only work if you're fooled, if you think you're getting a real treatment. Um, but just in the last few years, there have been lots of trials in different conditions, including um, anxiety, depression, migraine, chronic low back pain, ADHD, irritable bowel syndrome, showing that honest placebos still work. You can take a placebo and know it's a placebo, and it still works. And it seems that even if you consciously know there's no active ingredient, there's something about the act of taking a medicine, of being treated, that signals to the brain at some level that you're sort of safe, that you're being cared for, and that can be enough to trigger these kinds of effects. Um, but it's not all about pills. Um, alternative treatments can also trigger very large placebo effects. Um, there are a lot of therapies, things like acupuncture, Reiki, homeopathy, which in um, clinical trials are no better than um, fake or placebo versions um, of those therapies. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's okay, it's just a bit distracting. Uh, so most scientists would say that if, um, if a therapy is, does no better than placebo in trials, then it doesn't work, right? Just throw it out. But that isn't necessarily the case. I just want to tell you about one very large trial uh, in more than a thousand patients with chronic low back pain. And in that trial, they compared real acupuncture with placebo acupuncture, where the needles um, are put in the wrong places and they don't properly penetrate the skin. And in that trial, there was no significant difference between the ones who got the real acupuncture and the ones who got the fake acupuncture. That's often what you see in trials of acupuncture. But this trial was different because there was a third group and they got the best that conventional medicine had to offer, including painkillers. Now that group did barely half as well as either of the groups who got the acupuncture, whether it was real or fake. So what that's telling you is um, all placebos are not the same. Alternative treatments might not necessarily be working in the way the therapist claims. A fake or placebo version can be just as good, but they can trigger such large placebo effects that in some cases they can be better than the best that conventional medicine has to offer. Um, there are researchers trying to tease out why that is, doing some really clever trials, sort of comparing um, placebo treatments, but then varying things like the attitude of the practitioner, the length of the consultation. And they're finding that if you have a warm, empathic practitioner, if you have a, a good bond with the therapist or the doctor, if you have a long consultation time, all of these can have actually quite dramatic effects on the symptoms that are experienced by patients. So whether you're having surgery or whether you're having acupuncture, it's worth thinking about that and thinking about uh, the therapist or the doctor, whether it's somebody that you respect and trust and feel that you have a bond with. Um, scientists are also, though, developing now a whole load of um, therapies and techniques um, that are just based around trying to take advantage of this role of the mind. So this is a scene from a virtu immersive virtual reality game called Snow World, which has been shown to significantly reduce pain in burns patients who are undergoing some of the worst pain in medicine. Um, and there are now um, several companies making virtual reality worlds that you can buy that are specifically designed um, for reducing pain, including chronic pain. Um, there are um, other approaches where you can actually have... Um, exercises and tips delivered by apps on your phone to try and reduce chronic pain. So that's quite an, an exciting area of research right now. But in general, anything um, that you can do that's going to make you feel safe, positive, cared for, is, whether that's meditating, whether that's surrounding yourself with people that you care about, doing activities that mean something to you, all of that is going to help to reduce the, the warning signals in your brain and help to bring those symptoms down. Um, so, let's move on to learn. Um, I'd like you to take a look at these lemons for me. Um, could you imagine reaching out, picking up that piece in the front there, and taking a big bite? So sink your teeth into it, and just swallow down that acidic juice. Um, and just imagine doing that for me. And you might, um, if you have eaten lemons before, that's important, um, you might start to feel a tingling just at the back of your mouth here. I always do when I talk about this. Um, that is your salivary glands switching on. Your body has learned the appropriate physical response to a lemon. Um, it knows that you're going to need extra saliva to deal with that 
acidic juice. And that's not a response that we normally think of as being under conscious control. I couldn't just say to you, switch on your salivary glands, please. Um, but we can use a, a thought, uh, an image, to make that change happen. And it doesn't matter that you know that's not a real lemon. It happens anyway. So up to now, with um, placebos, we've been talking about symptoms but our brains are actually controlling a much wider range of um, physical changes, organs and systems um, throughout our body. And that's mediated by the autonomic nervous system, which runs from the brain to organs throughout the body, um, controlling and regulating things like um, heart rate, blood pressure, digestion in response to different changes in the environment. Um, and that sort of happens automatically, generally. We're not usually aware of it. Um, and, and a lot of those processes um, are innate but some of them are learned. Our bodies learn what physical responses have been needed in particular situations in the past, so that if we perceive ourselves to be in a similar situation in the future, it can trigger those changes in advance. It's, it's staying one step ahead, if you like, making sure that the body is ready before that change actually hits. Um, so the lemons, that's one example. Um, I don't know if there are any mums here who've breastfed their babies, but if you have, you probably um, noticed that just the sound of a baby crying is enough to trigger the milk. Um, learned responses are the reason why, you know, if you hear a, perhaps a song that your mum used to sing to you when you, you were a child, that can instantly calm you down. Um, learned responses, um, although often they are helpful, can also play a role in... Um, in medical problems and disease. Um, so, for example, with chronic pain, one theory about chronic pain is that um, the body, if, you're, if you injure your back, for example, your body will learn that there are particular movements or situations that cause you pain. And so, um, in the future, it will continue to trigger pain in those situations because it's learned that as a warning signal even long after the actual injury has healed. Learned responses can be behind phobias. If you um, were bitten by a dog as a child, for example, when you come across a dog as an adult, that can trigger the fight or flight response even if you know that there isn't actually any danger there. Um, Treatments like hypnotherapy, for example, one of the ways the hypnotherapy works is through trying to change and rewire those learned responses. Um, but just to really give you an idea of the power of these kinds of responses, I want to tell you a story about an experiment that went wrong. Um, this was a, a psychologist called Robert Ader in the 1970s, and he was interested in a phenomenon called learned taste aversion. So this, you might have experienced this. This is where if you eat a food, like prawns, for example, and you get sick, the next time you have prawns, even if you like them to begin with, it will make you feel sick again. It's sort of an evolved response it's to dissuade you from eating foods that have poisoned you in the past. Um, Ada was interested in how long that learned association between the taste of that food and the sickness lasts. So he did an experiment with bats, um, and he gave them water that was sweetened with saccharin, um, and this is usually a favourite treat for rats. They will drink more of that than normal water. Um, but in this experiment, he paired it with a drug called cytoxan, which made the rats feel sick. So after a few pairings, as he expected, the, the rats refused to drink the sweetened water, um, even when he gave it to them on its own, without any drug. So um, he then force-fed them the sweetened water just on its own, with no drug, um, to see how long it would take for them to forget that association and start drinking the water again. Um, but what happened next? It really seemed like black magic because they, um, they didn't forget the association. Instead, what happened was one by one, um, the rats fell ill and they died. Um, and it turned out that cytoxan wasn't just making them feel sick. It's, a, it's a, an immunosuppressant drug. It suppresses the immune system. And in this experiment, they weren't given anywhere near enough of the drug to kill them. But it turned out that what had happened was... When he paired the sweetened water with the drug, they didn't just learn to associate that sweet taste with feeling sick, they actually learned that immune response. So subsequently, the sweet taste on its own suppressed their immune systems enough that they succumbed to fatal infections and died. So in this case, a psychological cue, a sweet taste, was enough to kill them. Um, scientists have also shown that you can do the reverse. You can boost the immune system with these learned responses. Um, now, at the time when Ada was doing this work, that was seen as basically pseudoscience. Um, his work was rejected. Scientists were convinced that the brain and the immune system do not talk to each other. Um, they thought that the immune system responds automatically uh, to um, infection and injury without any help from the brain. Um, we now know, though, that actually there is extensive 
two-way crosstalk between the brain and the immune system. And again, it's helping um, the body to stay one step ahead of challenges that we're about to face in the environment. Um, so in the case of learned responses, the immune system, we've learned what immune responses we needed in a particular situation in the past so that they can be triggered again in the future in advance of waiting for that pathogen or whatever it is um, to actually enter our body. Um, what's really exciting about this, though, is the idea that we might be able to use these responses in medicine. Um, so this guy, um, Manfred Shedlowski, is a psychologist in Germany, has shown that um, just as in Ada's rats, we can train our immune systems to respond to psychological cues. Um, and he's doing that with this green drink. Um, it's a mixture of um, strawberry milk, lavender oil, and green food colouring. Um, I've tried it, it's disgusting, um, but it's like, it's really distinctive, it's like nothing you've ever had before, it looks green, but it, it um, sorry, yeah, it looks green, but it tastes purple because of the lavender oil, it's milky, oily, bitter, sweet, all at the same time, really distinctive, um, and that's the idea behind it, and, and he's shown that if you drink this drink, alongside taking uh, an immunosuppressant drug, so if you pair those together a few times, then subsequently this drink on its own will suppress your immune system in exactly the same way. And he's shown that with healthy volunteers, with patients with dust mite, allergy, and he's now getting um, really promising results with patients um, with transplanted kidneys. Um, and so these patients with transplanted kidneys, they have to take immunosuppressants every day to stop their bodies from rejecting those transplanted organs. Um, and that's a problem because these drugs are really toxic. They have horrible side effects. They're directly poisonous to the kidneys. As many kidney transplant patients lose their kidneys from the toxicity of the drug as lose them from immune rejection. Um, so anything that could reduce the drug doses that you need could prolong the life of those kidneys. And, and so the, the hope is that if you can train people's immune systems to respond to this green drink, um, without the need for drug or with a lower dose of drug, then that could really help those patients. Um, but actually, more broadly, um, this approach um, could be used um, in other conditions as well. There are trials going on at the moment um, in autoimmune diseases like arthritis, um, in allergies, and um, even work going on in cancer where some chemotherapy drugs work by modulating the immune system. Um, and the idea is that if we can reduce the drug doses that are needed by using the psychological cues, then that would reduce problems with drug toxicity, um, side effects, addiction, drug tolerance, cost. And, and I, I wanted to, to mention that just because I think it's a really exciting area of research, which isn't about either using a physical approach to treatment or a psychological one. It's about using those two things together in a really intelligent way. Uh, so the, the last section, reframe. Um, so this is essentially about stress, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, so stress is a, a physiological response, right? It causes physical changes throughout the body. Um, if you're feeling afraid or stressed, um, your pupils dilate, your heart, pressure, uh, your heart rate and blood pressure uh, rise, uh, blood is diverted from your stomach to your limbs and brain so that you can think and move. Uh, stress triggers a branch of the immune system called inflammation, which is the body's first line of defence against infection and injury. Um, and all of this is, is, can be useful in an emergency, it can help us to survive, but as we all know, if we're chronically stressed, if these responses are switched on all the time, that creates a lot of wear and tear on the body. And I was really surprised looking at this research just how bad it is, actually. Um, chronic stress um, causes gut problems, um, it contributes to heart disease, it exacerbates autoimmune disease, it makes us more susceptible to infection, it's been implicated in um, the progression of cancer, and even in the rate at which our cells age. If you're chronically stressed, you literally age faster. Um, and the good news about this is that stress is actually created, it's triggered in the brain. Um, just as with the placebo effects, it's not events themselves that cause stress, it's your response to those events. Um, it's, it's not so easy just to decide to be less stressed, so, but there's a lot of research that's going on into ways that we can change or reframe our view of events. Um, so I wanted to look at just a, a few of the approaches that scientists are looking at and look at how that can then um, affect our physical health as well. Um, so for the first one, I just wanted to make the point that um, 
not all stress is the same. So if you look at this picture here and imagine yourself as that skier, um, and just think about how you're feeling in that situation, about to go down this slope. Um, I imagine that maybe some of you are feeling a bit nervous, a bit apprehensive, a bit worried about getting injured. Um, whereas other people, if you're experienced skiers, you might be feeling quite happy and excited, thinking how much fun this is going to be. Um, so there's a lot that we bring to exactly the same situation, depending on our experiences um, and the skills that we have. Um, and psychologists call these two different states um, a threat state and a challenge state. So if you uh, don't feel that you have the resources to cope with a situation, if you're, if you're sort of focused on the negatives, you're worried about how badly things are going to go wrong, what you're going to lose, um, then um, that's the threat state. The challenge state um, is where you do feel that you have the resources to cope and you're focused on the positive. So it's essentially, do you think you're going to succeed <laughs> or fail? Um, and these two um, states have different biological effects on the body. Um, so essentially there's a sort of biological decision going on there as well about whether you think you're going to succeed or fail in this situation. Um, so if you're in a threat state, so in both states the heart will beat faster, but in a threat state, blood vessels will constrict. It's essentially your body has decided that um, you're probably going to lose in this situation, you're going to get injured, and it's, it's trying to minimise the blood loss when that happens. Um, the problem is that that puts a lot of strain on the heart, it can't pump oxygenated blood around the body efficiently, and that impairs your performance, both your mental and your physical performance. People who are in a threat state tend to recover quite slowly, and if you're in a threat state a lot over time, that strain on the heart can be very damaging to health. A challenge state, on the other hand, your, your, your body thinks it's going to win. It's not worried about minimising blood loss. It just wants to maximise performance. So blood vessels dilate. So now the oxygenated blood can pump efficiently around the body. Then that maximises your mental performance. You've got oxygen getting to the brain, maximises your physical performance. People tend to recover quickly. Um, and research has shown that actually short bursts of this challenge-type stress um, can actually be, uh, they actually strengthen the cardiovascular system and can be good for long-term health. Um, so the key question then is, can we push ourselves from a threat state into a challenge state? Um, and, and researchers have found that that's actually, can be surprisingly easy to do. There was a, a series of really interesting studies came out of the University of California, San Francisco, where they, they looked at students who were preparing for um, a really high-stakes, stressful exam called the Graduate Record Exam. This is a big exam that they have to do to get into graduate school in the US. And so they called in the students and got them to do a mock exam in the lab. Um, and one group of those students, they did something really simple. They just said to those students, if you went, so before they did, you do the mock exam, if you notice any um, signs of anxiety or stress, nervousness in your body, um, things like... Um, you know, uh, your heart's beating faster, perhaps you're breathing more quickly, butterflies in, the, in, the, in your tummy. If you notice any of that, that's a really good thing. That's your body working for you. That's going to make sure that more oxygenated blood gets to your brain and it's going to help you do better. And those students, um, compared to students who were given different advice or who were given no advice at all, um, their physiology changed. It pushed them from a threat state into a challenge state and they scored better on the mock exam. And not only that, they actually scored better on the real exam that they took three months later. So just a really tiny mindset change was enough to sort of get them focused on the positives of that situation and get them to feel more able to cope. And so that's a tip that I now use um, all the time if I'm facing something stressful. Um, but um, So that's something that you might find useful. But just generally, the point of if you can... First of all, prepare well to make sure that you've got the resources that you need in a stressful situation, but also think about what you've got to gain rather than what you've got to lose, and that will actually help you to perform better. Um, there are situations, though, where we don't necessarily want to sort of engage differently with a stressful event. We actually want to sort of try and remove ourselves from it. Um, 
such as in invasive medical procedures. So this is an incredibly stressful situation that people can go through where being stressed, having that fight or flight response can actually be really dangerous. Um, and so there are a lot of procedures, things like keyhole surgery, um, biopsies, tumour destruction um, that are carried out now where people are awake for the procedure um, and they're given drugs, uh, local anaesthetic, sedative drugs, um, but even with the highest safe doses of those drugs, these can still be really painful, distressing experiences. If you ask people to rate their pain and anxiety, their pain and anxiety basically go up through the procedure. The longer it goes on, the worse they feel. The more in pain they're in, the more distressed they feel. Um, and there's a group from Harvard University that have done um, a series of trials on hundreds of patients going through these kinds of procedures where rather than just relying on drugs, they took a more psychological approach. Um, they encourage patients to use visualisation techniques, mental imagery, to help them to relax. And again, it was quite simple. Um, just, thing, so just things like um, close your eyes and imagine yourself somewhere that you'd rather be um, and thinking about what that place um, looks like, smells like, sounds like, using all the senses. And they got really stunning results, actually. Just that simple intervention... Um, the pain and anxiety that those patients reported, instead of going up, it actually went down. So the longer the surgery went on, the more comfortable those patients felt. Their surgery went more smoothly, it was over more quickly, they only needed half the amount of sedative drugs compared to the control group. Um, and um, most interesting of all, the, um, the rate of adverse events, of complications during that surgery actually went down. They were significantly less likely to suffer those complications. And that's things like dangerously high or low blood pressure, prolonged lack of oxygen, post-operative bleeding. So pretty um, serious events. Um, and I just think that's, that's fascinating because when patients were enabled to use their own mental resources to cope with that situation rather than just relying on drugs, it didn't just make that procedure more pleasant, it actually significantly improved the physical outcome of that surgery. So those are a couple of approaches that you can use in the moment to deal with stress. Um, but to really change how we... Um, respond to events throughout our lives when sometimes our responses are things that we've built up over years and years and years you really need to do um, a more serious sort of retraining of the brain um, and one of the most studied approaches that scientists have looked at is mindfulness meditation so I just wanted to talk quickly about that um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, the idea of mindfulness, where we're concentrating on the, the present moment rather than worrying about the, the future or the past, trying to recognise negative thoughts for just what they are, just thoughts, not reality. Um, and there's been a, a lot of research into mindfulness, but one of the things that's really um, encouraged scientists to take it seriously in the last few years is, again, the neuroscience studies, so the fact that they can actually see what's happening inside the brain. And, and what they found is that mindfulness meditation doesn't just change the activity of the brain while you're meditating, it actually reshapes the, the physical structure of the brain. So people are then responding differently to stress all the time. So even in people who've just done an eight-week course of mindfulness meditation, um, they've seen increased grey matter in areas like the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, so areas involved in learning, memory, emotion regulation, and decreased grey matter in the amygdala, which is involved in the brain's response to threat. And this is the exact reverse of changes that you see in the brain in people who are chronically stressed, who've, who've suffered stress for many years. Um, so that's really exciting because it suggests that those changes can be reversed. Um, and there are a lot of um, clinical trials as well now suggesting that that does feed through into health. So there are hundreds of trials now showing um, when, that when people do mindfulness training, that reduces stress-related symptoms, things like um, pain, anxiety, fatigue. Um, I think that the next few years are going to be really interesting in then looking at, well, does that feed through into other more physical things, like immune responses, for example. There are a few studies um, suggesting quite promising results in terms of... Um, Things like infections, so there was one study found that people who did mindfulness meditation um, suffered fewer um, colds over the winter. Another one showing that it helped people to respond better to vaccinations. But there isn't quite the body of research yet that there is for the symptoms. Um, but hopefully over the next few years that will happen. And researchers are also starting to compare different kinds of meditation as well. 
And then the, the very last thing that I wanted to mention um, is um, what the research shows is probably the, the one um, most powerful thing that you can do um, to protect yourself from the damaging physical effects of stress. Um, and that is um, connect with others. Um, so there are lots of studies now, everything from uh, lab experiments um, looking at gene expression in cells of the immune system, comparing lonely people with socially connected people, through to um, epidemiological trials that follow the health of hundreds of thousands of people over decades. Um, and they're all showing that people who have warm relationships, rich social lives, and who feel like they're embedded in a group don't get as sick and they live longer. <sighs> Um, again, it's not necessarily as simple as just deciding to be more connected or surrounding yourself with people. We can be, um, you know, in the middle of a crowd of people and still feel really lonely. Um, so there is interest now in looking at approaches to um, basically train people to see the world in a more socially connected way. Um, and one of those approaches is through compassion training, for example. So we've heard a lot about mindfulness. I think the new generation of techniques, a lot of them are focusing on compassion. And I visited Emory University, where they've developed a technique called cognitively-based compassion training. Um, which is a combination of CBT and compassion meditation. Um, and they've had some really interesting results showing reduced stress and reduced biological markers of stress in a lot of stressed populations, including um, foster, uh, kids in foster care in inner city Atlanta, prison inmates, um, women in shelters, um, veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I think that's a, a really interesting area of research as well. And I just wanted to briefly tell you a story of um, a woman called Fina that I met in Atlanta. Um, she's a singer based in the Atlanta area, um, and uh, she went through this um, compassion training. Um, and I met her at the Marcus Autism Center in Atlanta. She has two sons, Ahav and Analiel. They were five and three when I met her, and they've both been diagnosed with autism, and they both followed a similar trajectory. They got to 18 months and then began to regress. So their, their speaking regressed, eye contact started to go, um, skills from catching a ball to potty training regressed. They were having increasing problems with, with behavior, lots of meltdowns and, and tantrums. Um, they were having play therapy, which um, did improve things, but they were still... Um, yeah, having all these tantrums, becoming violent towards each other and towards her. Um, with the stress of trying to look after them, she split up with her partner, so she was dealing with it on her own. She gave up um, performing and recording. Um, so, and she said she was just felt increasingly in chronic pain. So she was in pain every day. She had headaches, pain all over her body, insomnia. She was taking painkillers every day from having been this bubbly, a uh, sort of positive, warm person, she was now increasingly starting to question whether she was going to be able to keep looking after her sons. Um, and so I just wanted to read you, it's just a super short um, few lines from the book um, where she describes her experiences um, on that course. And, and I, I wanted to tell you this, this story because um, I think it shows really nicely not just the interconnection in our health between our minds and our bodies, but also how interconnected and dependent we are on each other um, and also it's just one of the most um, beautiful examples of reframing that I've ever come across. Um, Fina says she realised that autism had come to define her children in her eyes. All you see is a burden, she says. It was robbing me of so much I could give to them. During the course, instead of being overwhelmed by her own stress and misery, she started to view the world from her kids' perspective and to see them as individuals in their own right. In the class, I released a feeling of entitlement, she says, the feeling that I was supposed to have a life without these challenges. She had always tried to be a good person. I thought, this isn't what I put into the pot. Why am I getting this out? Then I realised these special beings were given to me because of what I put into the pot, because she had the strength and the compassion to care for them. And with that single thought, much of the stress in Fina's life disintegrated, Instead of feeling bitter and resentful, she says, I'm enjoying being with them. And her children have responded beautifully. Every day there's a new blossoming, she says. Ahab is drawing cruise ships in 3D detail, and Aliel is writing 25 songs a day. And the best moment of all, when Ahab said, Mommy, I'm so proud of you, because I know that now you love me even more. 
So this is my last slide. I just wanted to conclude by saying that after spending several years looking at all of this research, um, my, my message is that even though a lot of people think about the power of the mind over the body as somehow um, magical or, or, or mysterious, um, I think it's just biology. Um, we've evolved so that our perception of our environment um, and of what's about to come next influences our physiology in a way that um, helps our bodies to stay one step ahead, to be prepared for challenges that we're about to face. Um, that works through neurotransmitters and through nerves, um, and it affects both the symptoms that we experience um, and the risk and, pro uh, and progression of disease. Uh, and that means that the mind is not a miracle cure. There are clear limits to what it can do. Um, it can't create chemicals that the body isn't capable of making. It can't magically save us if the body is overwhelmed by um, disease or injury. We can't generally will changes to happen. We can't wish pain away or um, tell the immune system to respond in a certain way. Um, but on the other hand, this biology means that the skeptics are wrong too. Um, there are real biological effects here. The mind does have very real effects on our bodies. And with the right research, we can study, understand, and use those um, to lead uh, happier and healthier lives. Thank you. Um, Joe, that was fantastic, um, and although I've read your book and thought about this topic for years, I found myself again thinking, wow, this is actually remarkable in so many aspects of what I heard there. So um, I, there's a few questions I'd love to ask you. I'd love to open out to the audience and ask questions in a moment, but before we do that, because we'd love to get everyone involved, and this is a very much an action-focused community, I'd love to just take a moment to pause and actually ask you to each think about what do you think the implications of this are? Because in my mind, they're pretty big, actually. They're big potentially for the way in which our healthcare systems and thinking you know, it, it, you know, happens and is structured. But it's also potentially really big for us as individuals and as family members and partners and the children that we raise and so on. So I'd like to invite you just to maybe turn to somebody near you again and just will take maybe a minute or two to do this, but just to share your reactions to these amazing things that Joe shared with us this evening. What do you think this means for you and for us, generally. Over to you, just for a minute. Thanks. <laughs> no pressure. OK, thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt your conversations. I'm looking forward to hearing more of what you've been raising with each other because I think there are some really big implications of this. I, I just want to slightly take advantage of the fact that I have the microphone and, and ask Joe a couple of questions that I have been on my mind. And so just well, that wanted to make this all about me. Coming back to that example I shared at the beginning about my experience of, of back pain, um, although there was a Clearly, there was something sort of very physical around sort of stress-induced muscle tension. Actually, with hindsight, the biggest change when I kind of overcame that was moving from a fear state to a kind of sense of hope, very much like your sort of threat and challenge thing. So um, I had been told I had this hereditary degenerative condition. I had told I had a damaged spine. That made me really frightened, actually. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that was a big cause of sort of reinforcing the pain. And when I got beyond that, that really was one of the big shifts. And I look also at the way my wife experienced pain in the different childbirths, we, went, we had three children. In one case, there was a situation where we were quite worried and she was quite scared and, and the, the scale of pain she seemed to experience and talked about afterwards was very different to a different you know, childbirth when she felt much more hopeful and much less scared. So one of the things that comes to me as an implication of this is not only that we should try to create hope and, and, and so on and create those challenge situations, it's actually that the conventional system in some cases could be doing more harm than good. It's not just ignoring the power of the mind, it's actually setting us off in the wrong direction. So when we have that brief moment with a GP and they don't really listen, and when we get told, oh, you've got a damaged spine, and we get that sense of, you know, do, do, is that right? So it's, it's not just the, the conventional system's ignoring this potential benefit, that sometimes we might be causing harm um, through not understanding the power of the mind. Is that right? 
Yeah, there's a few different <laughs> things uh, there. To, uh, I think one of the things about the story that you were telling is it just shows the, the complexity of it's not always just as simple as, you know, mental state creates physical change. Like, our mental state is impacting on our physiology, but it's also impacting on our behaviour and, like you say, our muscle tension. And it's probably all of those things that are working together. And, and sometimes some of the most... Um, dramatic or important changes are actually in the way that you know you you behave differently if you have if you're more hopeful for example um and or if somebody with chronic pain um if they're if they're sort of too scared to go out because they think it's, it's going to hurt and then they, they're staying in and then you become isolated from people and then you have nothing to focus on but the pain and then that creates this sort of cycle of making it worse whereas just changing the mental state is perhaps you know tr creating those biological placebo effects, but it's also maybe giving someone the tools they need to actually get out and do things that are also then going to reduce that pain. So it's, it, it, there's lots of things that are all interconnecting. Um, but your, your question about, is it making it worse? Um, yeah, I think sometimes yes and sometimes no. So I think the medical system actually is incredibly good at triggering placebo effects, for example. Um, you know, so that all of the sort of symbols around the, the white coat and the pills and the prescription and all of this ritual, all of that is creating that meaning that, you know, you are being treated and you are going to get better and there's this incredible expectation around drugs. Um, so in, in that sense, it's actually using our psychological resources very well. And, and, and sometimes there are drugs, especially for things like pain and, and depression, where the, the drugs aren't, when you look at the actual data from the trials, the drugs aren't really doing that very m much at all, but they are allowing um, this, this hope and these placebo effects to occur. But yeah, there are lots of times when it is making things worse. I had a very similar um, experience with the birth of my two children as well with the the first one in hospital where just the way you're sort of treated and, and dehumanized and it's a very scary experience and different people are coming in that you've never met before um, and that really sort of adds to the pain in a situation like that um, and then GPs you know we we've got these trials showing that if you have a, a warm practitioner someone who asks you questions and listens to the answer a long consultation those really have quite dramatic effects on people's symptoms and yet we have shorter and shorter GP appointment times that's kind of you know stopping doctors from having that personal interaction even if they wanted to it's become all about that prescription and that pill so um, yeah I think there's a huge um, cultural shift that's that's needed so on, on that I mean I think when I was thinking about the implications of this I thought you'd already did a great job of giving us all some personal sort of ideas around things like meditation and compassion practice and reframing and the way that we think about difficult situations if you had a magic wand and could make some sort of systematic change happen in the way that we think about healthcare, I mean obviously one of them seems to me awareness raising your book had a big impact on me. I think the things you shared this evening are not as widely known as they should be. Obviously, part of this might be, can we get the establishment? That's probably the wrong term. But um, many people who have a huge influence over our healthcare systems to, to be more aware of this. And if so, how can we do that? And what sort of changes would you like to see as a result of, of what you've It's a nice, researched? simple question. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah there, there are so many things. I mean, I think just awareness raising and as individuals and having tools that we can use is really helpful um, because you know there are lots of medical we're always going to need physical drugs and treatments and so that there are always going to be times when we need to have um, that approach but then there are also a lot of things that perhaps we can do things to help to manage our symptoms on our own. You know, we're all in pain or fatigued at certain times. Um, so just having that, those resources really being empowered to sort of make a difference to our own health rather than necessarily immediately going on to antidepressants or mm. painkillers can be helpful. Um, but yeah, the more sort of systemic side within the medical system, it's really difficult. One of the problems is you know, we base our medical system on evidence, and I think that's a really good thing. I think we should do that. We should have trials to know whether or not things work. Um, but the problem is that the vast majority of clinical trials are funded by drug companies. Um, and so quite naturally, they're interested in testing whether or not drugs work. They're not really interested in testing whether, you know, longer consultations would be helpful. So by definition, 
you end up in a system where your whole medical system is based on drugs because they're the people who are doing the trials and that's the evidence that you're basing it on. So you need to look at things like where is the money coming from from the trials? So can you have um, other sources of funding, for example? And then I think there's also... Um, quite a lot of attitude shifting that needs to happen as well. We were talking earlier, like even the publicly funded trials tend to be very skewed towards testing the effects of drugs and not looking at the effects of, of other aspects of care. And there are just a few research teams, so Harvard have got a really good research team who are specifically looking at the um, sort of patient-doctor interaction um, and how that can affect things. So they are looking at things like attitude of the practitioner, appointment times, that sort of thing. Um, but there's not that much of it out there. So there's a, yeah, a whole um, range of different things that would need to change, I think. Thank you. So um, we've got more, quite a lot more time left for questions. So I'd love to invite you to ask some questions. We've got some microphones in the audience. So as always, if you could try and be as, uh, as brief as you can and end with a question, ideally. But actually, given the nature of this topic and given how many experiences there probably are in this room, if you wanted to briefly share your own experience of mind and body, ideally linked to a question, then that, that would be interesting well. But let's, let's respect each other and try and keep them brief. So I, the first time I saw, actually, was this lady at the top, which is unhelpful because we don't have microphones up there. But if you shout out your question, I can, I can repeat it to the audience. So can I just repeat that so people who didn't hear it downstairs? So somebody who has a, um, a stress-related condition like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, what's the ideal kind of mind-body connection that Joe might recommend? <laughs> Prescription, sorry. <laughs> I think that the, the thing there is that we are all different. So it's going to be different for different people. You have to think about what's likely to be helpful for you. So... Um, uh, when people look at the, the, the placebo responses, for example, people respond differently to different kinds of placebos. So somebody who has a lot of trust in conventional medicine and really likes the idea of taking drugs is likely, in addition to whatever the drugs are doing, to have a very large placebo response to those drugs. Whereas somebody who ha um, has had bad experiences with drugs in the past, suffered from side effects, or just is very... Um, sort of sceptical or suspicious about the, the, the pharmaceutical industry, whatever it is, they are not likely to have such a strong response and they may well have sort of negative um, responses to that drug. Um, whereas perhaps they actually really like the idea of um, acupuncture, say, or, or CBT, or there's something that really ap appeals to them, um, in which case they would probably have a better response to that. So you have to look at your own attitudes. If, if somebody thinks that just meditation is ridiculous, there's not much point in prescribing them to go and do a course of mindfulness meditation because they're not going to engage with it, they're not going to have high expectations for it, it's, pro you know, it's probably not going to do that much for them. So that there is a real personal aspect to it there. Um, also with irritable bowel syndrome and, and with a lot of conditions... Um, there's a lot, they're multifactorial. There are lots of different things that feed into irritable bowel syndrome, um, just using that as an example. Um, so a lot of patients with IBS have had gut surgery, for example, that has impacted on the function of the gut. There's going to be things like diet, genetics that are involved, as well as stress. Um, and the, the consultant that I um, talked to about IBS sort of talked about it as perhaps you need to get 100 points and then you've got and then you'll have a problem, but it could be that 90 of those points come from stress and 10 come from diet, or it might be that 70 of those points come from previous surgeries that you've had, and then the rest comes from genetics, and only like two points comes from stress. So depending on who that person is, and maybe, so hypnotherapy is a, something that's, um, there's really good evidence for an irritable bowel syndrome, but it will probably it helps everyone in terms of coping with their symptoms and improving quality of life. But in terms of changing gut function, it's going to depend on whether that's a person where stress was the main factor or not. So I'm really sorry not to be able to give you just one thing. But I, um, I suppose if there was one thing, it would just be that that knowledge, that empowerment, that that your mental state does make a difference in thinking about what matters for you. So it's something that you know I. You know, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I'm not suffering from a, sort of a, a major illness, but we, you know, we all have times that we feel ill or my, my kids get sick or hurt themselves or whatever. And I think just knowing that although 
you, you should listen to your symptoms. You don't have to be ruled by them. You don't have to be afraid of them. That changing your sort of attitude, you know, it gives you that sense of control, I suppose. And that would be the one thing that I'd want to pass on to people. Can I just ask, by show of hands, who here would say that they've had some kind of instance in their life of their sort of mental state having a, a, either a positive or negative effect on their physical health? Who, who sort of feels that they've experienced that? So that's, that's a really high proportion of us. Thank you. Okay, back to hands again. So who wanted to ask a question? So let's take this lady down here just on the right of centre. Thanks very much, Lauren. Um, I'm really... Is this one? Yeah. <laughs> I was really curious about how you set up and juxtapose threat versus challenge. And I was interested in the different neural recruitment that happens from one versus the other, because I would assume that in both cases you have a level of sympathetic drive, right, in order to mobilize your energy. And yet that difference, I think, is incredibly important. And you gave examples of how to specifically um, help to invoke that difference by expressing interoceptive cues as positive. But I'm really interested in neurologically what's different between the challenge and the threat response. What's happening? Great question. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm not an expert on this. I can give you the references afterwards if you're interested in following up. But there are differences in the amount of activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, can't remember which one's more and which one's less. I think it might be less with the threat, but I'd have to check that. And you also get release of um, cortisol in the threat state more than you do in the challenge state. So they do see those differences. Um, but I, yeah, I'm not an expert on the exact details. But you'd have to have some different kind of brain activity in order to have that perceptual shift that didn't cause terror. Because otherwise, it's You get quite philosophical there about which comes first, the change in the brain or the change in the mind, but it's just seeing things in a different way is, is changing the activity in the brain. I, Thank um, you for but, the question. Um, yeah, if you come and find me afterwards, I can, I can give you the name of the researchers and if you want to have a look at the, the, the papers that they published. Great. Can I see a show of hands again? So let's take this gentleman here and then we'll take uh, the hand that's over there. I can't see whose hand it is here with the blue top on. Thank you. Um, have you studied at all the nocebo effect, uh, which is the opposite? So, for example, if, let's say, those uh, uh, images of burnt lungs and cigarette packets have actually a negative effect on physical health of smokers? Or, um, or amplify, amplify negative effects? Yeah, yeah, so I didn't really, I didn't, uh, there were so many th things that I would have loved to have talked about that I didn't have time for, but yeah, so the, the, the nocebo effect, so this is the reverse of the placebo effect, so the idea is then if you have a negative um, uh, expectation for something, then that's, a, that's going to create symptoms, and there are very similar um, biological mechanisms that are involved, and I, th I think it's really a a spectrum that your sort of positive and negative um, expectations can, can push you up and down. And they can be um, quite dramatic. Um, there was one story um, about a guy who was in a trial uh, for antidepressants uh, and then he split up with his girlfriend, so he took an overdose of the, the pills that he had um, and lost consciousness, was carted off to hospital, and his blood pressure would drop dramatically, and they were pumping litres and litres of fluid into him until you can guess what's going to happen. The, the phone call came from the, the research group that he was actually in the placebo group, um, and when they passed this on to him, he recovered very quickly. Um, <laughs> And it's, I mean, it's easy to sort of laugh and think, oh, well, that would never happen to me. Um, but <laughs> but there, um, there are actually a lot of studies where, um, for example, you can tell people that, um, uh, you know, there's a mobile phone, there's this new kind of, or Wi-Fi radiation, for example, or if you tell people that there's been a gas leak down the road or um, a suspicion of a terrorist attack. There are all sorts of things where actually these things will start to create symptoms. Um, so it's just a case of finding a, a threat that's, um, that's realistic. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're told by somebody in a white coat, for example, that you've been diagnosed with cancer and you don't have very long to live, you can bet that you are going to start you know, to feel all sorts of, of symptoms. So the, yeah, these negative and positive expectations are, uh, are influencing our, our symptoms all the time. It's also reason to be wary of the side effects lists of, of drugs as well. There's a lot of studies showing that um, a surprisingly high proportion of side effects of drugs are actually nocebo 
effects. Um, you get a lot of people dropping out of clinical trials because of the side effects, um, when actually it turns out they were in the placebo group. This again makes me think so much about the language that the healthcare profession mm. uses really matters. So, for example, when a practitioner said to me, you've got a deformed spine, that's why you're in pain, it's only going to get worse. Had they said, you seem to have a slight spinal abnormality, you, your pain may be related to that, there may be some other things you could do that could help, and it may not be you know, always that way. Yeah. That's a very it's, you know, similar diagnosis in some ways, and yet radically different effect yeah. on me. The words that doctors use, and even the attitudes, even if the, the words are the same, have an impact on the symptoms. There were really interesting studies where... Um, the, the doctors were prescribing, I think it was all placebo in the end, but in some of the cases the doctors thought it was a real drug and some of the cases they, they thought it was a placebo. And I think in all the cases they were telling the patient it was a real drug. Um, in all the cases it was placebo, the only difference was what the doctor thought it was. And that had an, had an effect, just that the sort of subliminal messaging and the attitude of the doctor. So if the doctor thinks you're going to do well or doesn't think you're going to do well, that is going to wow. have an, an impact. And, and the studies, the, the Harvard team I mentioned, who were doing the visualisation with the surgery, so they've also looked at things like just changing the language that the medical staff use. So, for example, um, they, they showed that the, the medical staff love telling you how much things are about to hurt. Um, this came up again and again and again, and they actually see it as a, sort of an ethical duty in a way to warn you. But they showed that when anything to do with pain was mentioned, the patient's pain jumped up. Even if they were saying something like, "Oh, this isn't going to hurt," that that made the pain jump up. And so when they got them to change their their language um, um, and just say what they were going to do, but not necessarily talk about whether it was going to hurt or not, that really helped. Um, and the researcher, Elvira Lang, who's in the ch charge of that team, she suggests that the time to talk about whether things are going to hurt or not is in a conversation beforehand where you're take, going through sort of informed consent, and that's when you can sort of say what might happen during a procedure. But actually, during a procedure, she's very much of the opinion that you should remove all of that language. And I think more training in general for doctors about the, the significance yeah, that their words can have would be a really good thing. Yeah, great. Is anyone here from the health profession in broader sense? Anyone here working in the health sector? A few people. We need more. We need more. Um, so there's a lady over here who's got a microphone for the next question with a blue jacket. Thank you. Um, I'm in, I was interested to know whether the placebo effect extends to vitamins and by very end extent food. I mean, do we need food? I think there's somebody in Italy that lived on popcorn for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> For me, um, for me, that's um, that there seems to be this thing where people want to go to one extreme or the other. It's either the mind doesn't do anything or it can do everything. Either we should just have drugs or we can throw the drugs out of the window and we can heal ourselves with our mind. And and and, and for me, the, one of the really important messages I want to get across is I think that we need both. We need to work out what drugs are good at doing um, and what they're not so good at doing and what the mind is good at doing and use the strengths of each of those together. Um, obviously, there, you know, we have physical bodies and we are going to be affected by the limits of those bodies. Like when I was talking about um, pain, yes, your mental state is important, but so is, you know, if you've got a big gash to your, to your leg, these things are still feeding in. With, with fatigue, there's really interesting research showing that fatigue is actually not caused directly by, um, you know, ex exhaustion, you know, the muscles running out of oxygen or buildup of, of toxic byproducts. It's actually a psychological sensation that the brain puts in place ahead of that happening. The brain's deciding how safe how much exertion is safe um, and then imp imposing fatigue at a certain point to, to get you to stop before you get to that dangerous point. But that doesn't mean that if you could just use your mind, you could do superhuman feats and break world records. You know, you're still limited by the physical nature of your body. It's just that the mind gives you that leeway. So I think it's really important to, to realise the, the, the importance of the physical <laughs> as well as the mental. Thank you. Sorry, can you, can you put your hand up? Because when you... I couldn't... Oh, sorry, there you are. I couldn't see where you were before. What I meant was that, you know, in moving, as we become more open to an alternative, so some, 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 what's happened is we've moved to, like, maybe away from drugs, but to taking health... Charge of our own health care. 
And a lot of that is about you know, alternatives which are perceived to be safe, mm. vitamins, you know, supplements. But, I mean, is that, do they, is that just really as much a placebo effect as... Oh, I see. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, Would you like to just paraphrase what you think the question was for the benefit of those who didn't make sure I've got it right this time. So, um, about supplements and other so things. So you're saying so a lot of um, dietary supplements and um, th that kind of vitamins, that kind of thing, you're saying are they just working as placebos yeah. as well? Yeah. I mean, it could be. I mean, obviously, vitamins ca uh, uh, can have biological effects as well, so they're not pure placebo, but it could be that a, a lot of it is triggering that. But, you know, I don't have a particular issue with that. I th you know, if, if, it's, if it's both and you're getting both, then, you know, why not? Um, but in, in general, I think when it comes to nutrition, there is... A, a much bigger role for the mind than uh, people often realise. So, you know, with um, sort of food intolerances as well, when you talk to placebo researchers, they think that a, a lot of that is actually driven by placebo and nocebo effects. So obviously there are real food allergies and food intolerances, so I'm not saying it's all in the mind, but certainly if, if someone is suffering from a problem and is sort of def desperately searching for something and you're just trying different things, cutting different things out of your diet, adding different things in, you can start to think of different, you know, and then it happens to get slightly better that day or slightly worse that day and you'll think, oh, it was that that made the difference and that gives you a certain level of expectation that then reinforces the effect the next time. Um, so there's, there's definitely um, a, a lot of um, yeah, psychological effects going into the way that we respond to what we're eating as well. Thank you. Can I just see a show of hands for other questions who people would like to ask? Okay, let's come and take one from down the front here. So, um, Debbie and Jasmine here, I'm not sure. Um, and then let's see some more hands so we can get another microphone. Um, where is our other microphone there? So, can we take this lady towards the back here next after, this, after these at the front, after Thank Debbie? Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm going to make a special interest comment and then an invitation to you. I have um, a chronic pain condition which has now been diagnosed as post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm aware there are lots of other chronic pain sufferers, some of whom have really benefited, I guess, from being involved with Action for Happiness. But what I've found is that positive psychology and our own personal interventions can only take us a certain step of the way. And I would urge anybody who's suffering from chronic pain to consider whether there's some sort of traumatic memory that they haven't been able to process because of the way the memory was laid down in the first place that is causing their pain. I have regular acupuncture, which has amazingly freed up a lot, and it's come through physically via the vagus nerves from my gut. It's been a most extraordinary experience, and I'd like to invite you, if I can arrange it, to come and watch me having acupuncture and notice the many, many sophisticated techniques that the acupuncturists are using to treat me and presumably other people like me. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I was, a little, I was a little bit hard on acupuncture earlier because in, in a lot of studies, there is no difference between placebo acupuncture and real acupuncture. Um, but actually, um, I wrote a feature on this recently. There's some really interesting neuroscience research showing that even though... Um, you can often see the same level of, of pain in both groups. What's happening in the brain is actually very different, and you can actually see sometimes there are sort of functional changes that are happening in the real group and not in the placebo group. So I did simplify there. I actually think out of all the, other, all the treatments that I mentioned, acupuncture is the one where I think there are really some very interesting things going on. So I'll, I'll say that first. But I think what you, you, you mentioned about the, the trauma is really interesting because... I don't want to leave people with the impression that these things are necessarily easy, that you just, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of little tricks because it's nice to say to people, you know, you do this one quick thing and it has this effect. But often with chronic pain and other chronic conditions, this is the sum of, of years and years of whether it, it trauma or learned experiences. There's a whole lifetime that's taken somebody to a place. And so just one five-minute change of mindset isn't going to do it. It's going to be 
years, I imagine, of hard work to get to get out of that. Um, so for that, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, great question and lovely answer as well. Thank you. And then the lady's got a microphone here. Thank you. Hi, I'm a veterinary surgeon, and we've looked at the placebo effect when either the, the vet or the owner doesn't know it's a placebo. And we actually do see placebo effects in dogs and cats. Have you looked at it in children? Um, yeah, I mean, I, so, I mean, I don't do studies myself, but I have looked at studies and spoken to researchers who have looked at it um, in, in children. Um, so, yeah, with animals and children, it's an interesting one. I mean, obviously, a, a, a child, if they understand that... Yeah, um, um, if it, yeah, a, a child can have a placebo effect in their, their own right, absolutely. Um, and it's something that I actually use in my parenting all the time now. That if, mm. you know, if my child's fallen over and grazed their knee or whatever, or I'm putting cream on eczema or, or whatever it is, I make sure that I am really making a big deal of that, if you like. I'm telling them how it's going to help them. Or, or even if I don't have anything with which I can take their pain away, I know that my words and caring for them is going to trigger those biological changes and bring that pain down. And I've actually found that really helpful. Um, but the, there is a, another effect as well where um, just the, the parent knowing um, that there, you know, there's, a, there's a, a treatment there can affect their attitude and that then affects the children in return. And I think that's probably what's going on when you see placebo effects in animals. There's a change just in the attitude of the owner. Um, so I mentioned that study with the doctors where um, just whether they thought there was a drug there or not affected the uh, placebo effects in the patients. And that happens in children too. There was, um, I opened the book actually with a, a story about autism and this particular gut hormone um, that became, it was, a, it was a phenomenon in the States um, a few years ago where a few parents um, noticed that it was sort of helping their children and then suddenly there was a massive rush on it and hundreds of patients were all, uh, parents were all trying to get hold of this particular hormone and the companies were running out and there were TV shows about it and it was this amazing new miracle cure and then when they did the clinical trials on it, they realised that it had no effect over placebo at all. And those children didn't necessarily understand that they were being given anything, but it was through the parents. And I think it might be similar to that story with Fina, where, you know, changing your attitude to something then affects that relationship with the people that you're caring for, and that can then trigger those events. But um, you tell me, is that <laughs> how do you interpret it? No, absolutely, I agree. And I think we just need to do more research in animals as well. Yeah, well, I mean, often that's used, I think, for homeopathy, that people will say, well, you know, homeopathy is having an effect in the animal, so it must be true. Um, but I would say that's not necessarily the case. No, we're having debates about that with the British Veterinary Association. Oh, I see. <laughs> OK, so let's see a show of hands for the questions. So the gentleman here in the orange scarf, let's go there. Thanks, May. Um, anyone else upstairs got any questions? Or should we leave you with that upstairs? Uh, if you can see someone else there, Lauren, then we can give them the question. We've probably got time for two more, I think. There's a hand here, actually. A lady with a purple scarf. So, over to you, sir. Hi. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. Um, quick question. You mentioned uh, the digital world very briefly with the um, sort of 3D, um, you know, virtual reality and, and the cell phone apps, which uh, might be helpful. Um, obviously, the world is becoming a lot more digital our lives are, at least in this part of the world, and um, a lot of the talk around it tends to be negative in terms of, you know, its impact on our social interactions and everything. And I wondered what, what your discussions, your research have led you to, uh, to think about that. Yeah, I think, like you say, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Like, you know, as a parent, I'm obviously really concerned about social media and screen time for my kids. And a, a, but, but then, on the other hand, it's a really um, interesting, exciting way of reaching people. So, you know, a, an app that's sending people messages is a really good way of meeting somebody, uh, of reaching somebody in the moment when they need it, who perhaps can't necessarily. Um, be getting out to a clinic or whatever it is. And I think the virtual reality is, is really interesting um, because it's just, um, it's immediate and, and, and compelling. Um, and in the studies of that Snow World, um, they showed that it's, um, 
it's much more effective than other forms of distraction like video games or music, for example. And they think it's that um, quality of immersion. You, you feel physically in that place when you're in immersive reality, virtual reality, I'm sure you know. Um, and it's that sort of illusion, if you like, that's sort of fooling the brain and making it think that you are somewhere else that seems to be um, so effective in, in reducing that pain. Um, and now the interest is switching to, well, can we use that for chronic pain? So with chronic pain, you can't be in virtual reality all the time, but it is a really interesting way of, um, first of all, showing people that their pain isn't inevitable. So if they feel like they're in pain all the time and they go into the virtual reality and they feel that it's dropped, that's just really powerful in itself. But then also combining that with things like biofeedback um, to help people to learn to calm their bodies down, for example. So there's, um, I got to try one world where it's monitoring your blood pressure and your heart rate and, and you can... Um, uh, as you calm yourself down, all these um, it's called glow, and all these fireflies, you're in the forest and they all kind of come down and, and settle in your hands. So there's a real visual way of seeing your physical state and you can learn how to calm yourself down. So things like that, I think, are, are really exciting. Yeah. Great, thank you. So we're running out of time, and, and before we go, I'd like to make a, a quick announcement, which I hope you find interesting. But before that, I think we had one final question from a lady here. Yes, thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, it was just about mental health. I mean, there's an epidemic of mental health problems in this country and other development countries, really. Um, what do you think, I think it might link with what you were just saying, um, what do you think uh, we can do or what this new approach could offer to people suffering with mental health problems? Um, I should say at the beginning that I, in the book I didn't look a lot at mental health partly because it's such a big topic and I was mostly trying to limit to what we can do with our minds and how does that affect the physical body but obviously there isn't sort of a clear cut <laughs> boundary between mental and physical health so you can't really look at one um, without the other. Um, I, I do think that all of this is just as relevant if not more relevant to mental health so all of the things to do with feeling safe and cared for, feeling hopeful about the future, um, uh, are completely relevant to mental health. So in depression, for example, um, you get very large placebo effects in depression. Um, and there have been um, a lot of studies now looking at all of the data around um, clinical trials uh, for antidepressants and showing that actually for mild to moderate depression, there is practically no difference between antidepressants and placebo. What the antidepressants are doing is enabling those placebo responses, if you like. They're giving people that hope, that positive expectation, giving them the sort of support they need to sort of change the mindset and the behaviour, if you like. Um, and that's why you're seeing now um, approaches like um, cognitive behavioural therapy, mindfulness meditation, for depression. Um, there's obviously still a place for medication in some cases that can really help some people, but I hope, I hope that we're moving away from the idea of as a default medicate. Um, I really think that we should be exploring these, these other approaches first and then going towards medication because there are so many downsides of the medication. So, I think that's a, that's a really great question and, and point to end on. And, um, Joe, I, I'm, I'm struck by lots of things you said this evening. One, one particular I'd like to bring us back to as we close is your, your mention of compassion. And I think one of the loveliest things for me about this is it's not just hopeful, I think, for us about the link between our own minds and bodies, but actually it reminds us that the way we speak to each other, to loved ones, the way we make people feel, whether they feel loved and safe and cared for, really does make a big difference physiologically as well as sort of in terms of relationships. And that's really powerful. So please join me in giving Joe a really big thank you to the team. Thank you. Thank you.